Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in private practice in Harley Street, London, and I'm delighted to be joined now by Cass R. Sunstein. And we're going to be talking about his latest uh, exciting and interesting and important book entitled On Freedom. Cass Sunstein is the Robert Walmsley University Professor at Harvard Law School, where he is the founder and director of the Programme on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy. From 2009 to 2012, he led the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. His many books include the New York Times bestsellers Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth and Happiness with Richard H. Thaler, and The World According to Star Wars. So, um, Professor Sunstein, you're very interested in the notion of how do we help people be truly free? And you're coming at this from a slightly different and interesting angle, which is the notion of navigability, life being navigable, society being navigable, and systems being navigable. And you give a lovely example in the book about when we arrive at a hotel in a foreign country, we try to get into the shower and make the shower work, we often spend quite a long time unable to make it work and we get scolded. And so there's a sense in which hotels don't really help you navigate uh, their shower. And that's a kind of metaphor or analogy for life and particularly government systems in general. So tell us a bit about this concept of navigability. Well, uh, you have it exactly right. So if you go to a hotel in a country with which you're unfamiliar, it might be that the shower is in a foreign language and to know how to make it hot enough or to make it go on or to make it go in the right direction might be extremely baffling. The hotel shower is not navigable. And actually inspired partly by my own incompetence at getting hotel showers to work properly in places that I am not familiar with, uh, it occurred to me that if you are um, old and trying to deal with some new technology, it might be that you're like in a shower that you can't manage, or if you're dealing with a criminal justice system and fortunately for you it's your first time or unfortunately for you it's your third you may be just baffled by how to get your way through the system even if you didn't do anything wrong or if what you did wrong was minor and it shouldn't be uh, a living nightmare or if you're dealing with a website that is supposedly there to help you and it might be that it's just baffling you and you Uh, give up on something that's pretty important, or it might be some government program that involves a license or a permit or a healthcare benefit of some kind, Uh, the problem of navigability may defeat you. And so the basic idea is that even if we have freedom of choice, we're not free unless we know how to get to our own preferred destination. And you invoke some other interesting concepts here, which include choice architecture and choice architects. Tell us about those. Uh, So this idea was developed in concert with my friend and co-author Richard Thaler. And the basic idea is that uh, whenever we are confronted with a situation, there's an architecture that's there. Even if it seems invisible to us, it might just seem like a room or uh, a road or an office, Uh, but there's an architecture there, and it may crucially determine what we end up choosing, even if we have freedom. So we might go to a grocery store, and it might be that the uh, brownies and chocolate chip cookies are right there. That's part of the choice architecture, and so we select them, even though if they'd been back of the supermarket, we might have thought, Uh, you know, I kind of don't want those brownies because I'm gaining a little bit of weight. And a website will have a choice architecture too. What's in large font or the quickest uh, things that you click on and you can get them immediately, that will uh, uh, decisively often uh, affect what people end up choosing. So we will have freedom of choice in a society that respects liberty. Thank goodness for that. But there are often subtle features of the environment that we did not choose that end up being crucial in determining what we end up choosing. But we seem to be surrounded by choice architects, let's say advertisers or governments or or politicians who want to push us in a certain direction. You're referring to an idea that you keep referring to in the book. You want to preserve people's freedom, freedom to choose otherwise. And you point out that the, the, the way that systems work is they often coerce us or manipulate us. But you're really against coercion and manipulation. Why? Uh, uh, Completely. So 
Uh, I'm with John Stuart Mill, basically, not on everything, but basically. And the idea here is that most of the time, if you want to have ice cream or vegetables or to go on vacation in one place rather than another, so long as you're not hurting others, you should be allowed to do that. So if you are hurting others, there's a legitimate place for coercion. And if you're really hurting your future self, then coercion should certainly be on the table. Uh, but basically, in a society that wants to enable people both to develop their own faculties and also to have good lives, uh, a presumption, at least, should be in favor of freedom of choice. So that rules coercion out, not always, but as a, a presumption. Uh, manipulation is in the same family as coercion. So when people are manipulated, they're tricked. And the problem with manipulation is, first, it's disrespectful to the chooser. It treats the chooser as a kind of infant. And second, that it is likely to lead the chooser, at least much, much of the time, in a direction that is not in the chooser's interests. So if someone's manipulating you rather than treating you with respect, you're entitled to ask, why didn't you let me decide on my own? Why would you manipulate me? And the reason you might be asking that question is you're thinking that person doesn't have your best interests at heart. Uh, he or she has their own interests at heart. And that's a very reasonable concern. So we should be worried about coercion and manipulation. They, in free societies, should be, uh, you know, narrowly cabined. Manipulation may be out of bounds in general, uh, coercion narrowly cabined. But we need to know that freedom of choice, even where it genuinely belongs, isn't enough. Just like if you're on a street and told, you know, you have freedom of choice, if you don't have a GPS device or if you don't know how to navigate your way to the place you want to go, uh, you are in an important sense unfree. You're in, you're in a kind of prison. You, you emphasize this notion of freedom, hence the title of the book, but I think to the casual observer, it's difficult to see why a nudge, and you may want to just run over an explanation of what a nudge is, is so different from a manipulation, because it feels to the casual observer they're very close to each other. Um, I, I hope not, though I, I completely hear you. So if you buy um, a product and it says warning, don't use it in this way, because if you do, you will run a serious safety risk. That is a nudge, and it's not manipulative in the least. If you buy a food product and it has information that there's some um, ingredient to which people with certain allergies would be, uh, you know, really at, at, at risk if they consumed the food, uh, that's a nudge. It's not a form of manipulation. It may be a warning. It might be just information disclosure. A, re a reminder is a nudge. You know, if you don't pay your bill on time, you're going to be faced with a late fee. That's a very prominent nudge. The UK government has been involved in a lot of nudging in terms of uh, reminders and uh, information and uh, default rules where people are automatically enrolled in a plan but completely subject to uh, their own choice. They can opt out if they want. That's like a, a GPS device which gives you a default route, but you can say, I don't want that route. I want my own. So when we're talking about nudges, which are things like GPS devices, or uh, or things that uh, tell you what the social norm is, what most people do, uh, those don't cross the, the line into manipulation because they don't prevent people from exercising freely their own deliberative capacities to go in the direction that they want to. I can see why this book is a clarion call for the electorate, the man on the street, the consumer, the service user, to think about navigability and demand better, better navigability from governments and companies and service providers. But what I don't see is why a government would want to back your book. I can see why they prefer to go down the coercion manipulation route, because they, they want to take freedom away from people. They want people to be obedient. What do you think? Well, I, work, I worked in the U.S. government for four years, and I've worked very closely with the government in the U.K. I've worked with governments in many countries, uh, in, including not in a 
you know, routine basis, but occasional basis in uh, Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands and uh, and Qatar. And in general, I wouldn't say, you know, I know all of these countries extremely well. I know mine in the UK. Uh, the idea of nudges is extremely popular. And it's because those governments, the US and the UK, I was recently in Argentina, which is keenly interested in this also, uh, they respect freedom. And the idea is if you're dealing with a health or safety problem, um, you don't want to say you're going to go in j- go to jail if you don't eat the foods that are healthiest for you. But if you want to help people to find their own preferred way to health, that's something that governments are enthusiastic about. So in the United States, we're interested in um, calorie labels. And we actually have a calorie label mandate, which I worked under President Obama. The Trump administration is also very enthusiastic about it. So people can make their own choices with information. To ban things that are high-calorie foods probably isn't a very good idea. Yeah. People are allowed to eat things that have high calories, but to uh, give people encouragement in the form of a, a nudge so that if they want on reflection to choose the low calorie food, at least they uh, have the information to equip them to make that choice. Many of the things that the UK government and the US government have been doing have involved finances and to help people involving with involving credit card usage or mortgages that inform them about what strategies would involve uh, avoiding of, let's say, late fees or overuse fees, uh, that's something governments are keenly interested in. To prohibit a transaction between, let's say, a bank and a consumer, that's pretty heavy artillery. And in the United States and the United Kingdom, that's not our preferred way of going. So I can say from much of my experience over the last decade and more, uh, governments are keenly interested in freedom-preserving approaches. You also seem to be against incentives. Why why are incentives different to nudges? Well, I wouldn't say that I'm against incentives. I would just say that they're different from nudges. So they certainly have an important place. You might think that it's a good idea to have a, a stiff tax on cigarettes. I actually think that is a very good idea. That's an incentive not to smoke, which is probably good for uh, teenagers who are thinking whether to smoke. And it's also good for people who are uh, combating a smoking addiction. It's not enough, but it's probably helpful if there's an incentive. Um, And so that's a good idea to have incentives of various sorts with respect to uh, environmental harm so that people who impose harms on others are disincentivized. That's a really good idea. Uh, The only point to add is that sometimes incentives are best accompanied by, and in other cases are best replaced by, uh, nudges. So a GPS device is better, I think, than if you take the route that is maybe not the fastest route to your preferred destination, you have to pay a fine to the government. That wouldn't be a very good idea, though it would be an incentive. With respect to many products, to give people warnings and information is a good way of protecting safety and health, and to give a a, a tax or a subsidy would be heavier-handed, and there's a lot of data suggesting doesn't work as well. So often the nudge intervention, that is the analogy of the GPS device or the uh, put in the grocery store, the healthy foods in the most visible location, those are the things that are most the, the most effective and the most cost effective. Not always, but sometimes. You have another interesting phrase in the book, a behaviorally informed policy. What, what is a behaviorally informed policy? Okay, so you could have, uh, with respect to organ donations, say, a policy which would say, if people want to be organ donors, they can, they can opt in. Now that might be the best idea, but it's, uh, force. So if people are asked ever, uh, opt in if you would, you might get less participation than you expect, not because people aren't interested in opting in, but because they got a lot of things to do. So to switch from opt-in to opt-out, as some countries have done for organ donation, this is very controversial, I know, but all I want to make is the behaviorally informed point. I don't want to evaluate it as necessarily good. But when they've switched from opt-in to opt-out, it's that we know inertia is important and you'll probably save lives that way. Another behaviorally informed approach that's less controversial, by the way, is called active choosing 
where you overcome inertia just by asking people, say, when they're getting their driver's license, do you want to be an organ donor? And this is just a point about a behaviorally informed policy. Many um, utility providers, electricity providers all over the world have been thinking about automatic enrollment in environmentally preferable um, energy sources like wind or solar. And that is a behaviorally informed approach by which people are automatically enrolled in the cleaner energy source, but told if you want to opt out, if you want to use coal, let's say you can, uh, what do you think? Uh, for savings programs, both the UK and the United States, Denmark too, have benefited from uh, a behaviorally informed strategy by which people are automatically enrolled in uh, savings programs. I think that one of your concerns in the book, because you make an interesting distinction about being rich and being poor. I think you're particularly concerned about navigability for the poor. You seem to believe that the rich can kind of like make mistakes and they're not so lethal to the rich. But the, for the poor, it's more lethal. They, they haven't got the luxury of making the kind of mistakes in navigation the rich can. Could you say something about uh, whether you are particularly concerned about navigability as a concept, particularly for the poor? Uh, I am. Um, for all of us, uh, once in a while, uh, navigability problem will be very challenging. Uh, even people with a lot of resources are sometimes defeated by the navigability problem. If they're dealing with, let's say, a website or a government office or a company that's asking them to fill out forms. But for poor people, it's often really rough because um, they have to navigate systems uh, which for them are daunting, if for no other reason than that they don't have a lot of time on their hands often, and they often have um, uh, a lot of things to sort out in a day. So another way to put it is if you're not poor, if you just go about your life with your family and your work, things are probably fine. Water's clean, air is clean enough, um, uh, you don't have to worry about criminal violence very much. Uh, the day's going to be okay if you don't attend to water and air and criminal violence. But for poor people all over the world, and sometimes in wealthy countries, if they don't attend to things like air quality and water quality, and certainly uh, being free from criminal violence, they're in trouble. And that means that the navigability problem is hitting them left, right, and center. And often the problem of unfreedom for people who don't have resources lies exactly there. The uh, scarcity of time and attention for them because they're solving a zillion problems at once or trying to, and the uh, extreme challenge of trying to navigate a world which isn't well designed for them. The architecture is just really tough. And I'm thinking now of issues of health and safety, especially in the developing world. But it, but it seems like this is one of the really profound points of the book, that the whole function of a society, we'd all live in a better place if we saw a lot of the problems that beset the poor or the consequences they face as coming down to issues of navigability, that society should be a lot more oriented towards this idea of making life much more navigable, particularly for the poor. Uh, completely. So if you think about, for example, uh, health, and if you're poor and you're uh, sick or your children are sick, at least in many countries, the problem is not fundamentally one of dollars or euros. The problem is fundamentally one of what do I do? How do I get help? And that problem of what do I do? How do I get help? How do I manage um, uh, a system? that is uh, not designed to make things simple for me is um, extremely destructive. It might involve education, by the way. It might involve healthy food. It might involve uh, access to employment opportunities where there are training chances there in many countries, but good luck trying to figure out how to uh, get access to them. It's just too daunting. What are the things I feel, I mean, I, I feel your book's very idealistic and, and a very worthwhile read. But for example, I think they're, they're vested interests against navigability. So I'll pick it up an example that I have personal experience of. The National Health Service here in Britain, referred to by Americans as socialized medicine. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist. The mental health side of things here is completely overwhelmed. So in a way, they don't make the system navigable for 
impoverished, mentally ill people to try and negotiate their way through to get proper help because they're so overwhelmed it's in their interest to kind of defeat the consumer. So I feel that often their vested interests at work to try and not make things navigable because it helps protect an overwhelmed system from being even more overwhelmed. Completely. And there's a term, it's a, it's a new term. I use it in the book, though I didn't invent it. Uh, sludge, which is not a new word, but in this context, it's a new term. Sludge is like friction that makes it very hard to get from one place to another. And you can think of it, you know, in the literal sense, sludge. But also if you are, uh, let's say, suffering from depression or acute anxiety, and you're trying to figure out how to get help, and this is especially, as you know well, especially searing, uh, the sludge may get in your way. And that means a life might be ruined or a month might be devastatingly painful. And there's absolutely no reason for it. Now, your point, which is quite right, is sludge is sometimes a product of inattention or accident or a failure of empathy. But sometimes it's a deliberate choice to impose sludge on a system so as maybe to save money or so as maybe to punish certain people or so or maybe just to allocate scarce resources. Uh, sludge is a, a great evil in, um, uh, in, in the world. In, uh, in, in, it's the devil's work. In, in poor countries and, and wealthy countries, sludge, especially in the medical area, is uh, something that uh, if we could have a sludge elimination act, it would be a, a little bit like uh, not, not as good, of course, as an anti-slavery uh, initiative, but it would be in the same very extended family. Now, the book ranges widely. It's a very short book. It can be read in, in one sitting, and that's a compliment, by the way. Um, and uh, it really does change the way you think about the world. But th there's how to navigate the shower in the hotel. There's how to navigate a system, like the justice system or the health service system. Um, there's how to navigate life. Um, I would argue, I mean, you, you teach at an elite education institution, that an elite education should leave its students better able to navigate life when they leave an institution such as yours. But because these students are often chasing a grade, because for them, I'm, I'm going to be blunt here, a degree is basically a ticket to a job, uh, particularly maybe a job in a bank. But the, I, I think education is leaving students increasingly unable to navigate uh, the world when they leave educational institutions because of this galloping to the grade thing that we're seeing. But, but what are your thoughts about the link between, because you're an educator, between education and, and how, helping people navigate life? I, I agree with what you said. So one goal, certainly, of the early years of education, that is from a quite young age to a, let's call it a less young age, is to help people to get through uh, life, to navigate life, whether it involves um, managing your workload or dealing with complicated situations or handling an interaction with, let's say, uh, an abstraction like a hospital or, or a corporation. That's one thing it's, it's, it's doing. I feel a little like with respect to the educational system in general, which you point to, it's as if it's an elephant and I'm like a blind person so I can touch parts of it. Uh, and the part I touch is law schools. And when law schools are working well, they that's the the area I know best. They do help people who graduate uh, help their clients navigate the legal system. Now, whether law students once they've graduated can navigate life, um, I'm kind of agnostic on that. But if they're do, doing their jobs well, uh, if anyone comes to them, and I feel this happens a lot, they can say basically within 15 minutes. Uh, here's what you should do or shouldn't do. It's a little like a doctor, and 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 that is if that's if that does happen. So that if someone you know your brother or your friend says, "How do I handle this uh, apparently illegal thing that happened to me?" Uh, that quick ability to help the person navigate that situation that is there. One final question, uh, and I appreciate I've kept, I've kept you uh, long past the time I should have kept you, but it's such a fascinating book. Um, you you may make a quote. There's a quote from Hayek, the famous philosopher and economist, about the importance of the fact that we, and I think by we, I think you mean governments or 
or choice architects can't know exactly what the individual knows. I mean, it's, a, it's an argument for individual freedom, and I think for free markets. Um, could you just say a little bit about that? Because I think it's quite a profound point. Yes. So uh, Hayek is one of my heroes, uh, and Hayek's view is that the reason markets outdo planners, and Hayek was the great critic of socialism, is not that the planners are ill-motivated or self-interested or corrupt, the fund, though they may be all of those things. The fundamental reason is that markets just include a lot of information. So the price of, let's say, shoes or of cell phones uh, includes the tastes and uh, knowledge and values of so many people who are deciding what to buy. And Hayek's claim is that uh, if you rely on markets, not that they're perfect, Hayek didn't believe that they were perfect by any means, but they will do better than a planner because if you get five people or 50 people or even 150 people, how are they going to know uh, what the right cell phone looks like or what the right price of a cell phone is? Uh, let the market decide. Now, I think that's a, a great uh, view of a substantial part of the picture, not all of the picture. The fact, of course, that uh, markets can create terrible harm as where people are treated fraudulently or where there's a monopoly and there isn't a market anymore. Hayek's completely on board those trains. What he didn't quite see is the navigation problem where markets may not solve the navigation problem for people. They often do help, um, but Sometimes we need a new market entrant, let's say, uh, to help people solve the navigation problem. Sometimes we need public officials to put up that calorie label or some signs to help us get to where we want to go. Well, Professor Cass Sunstein, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. It's been a delight. The book, again, is called On Freedom, published by Princeton University Press. Professor, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. A great pleasure.